overall, 14,728 individuals have been tested for COVID-19. Currently, we have 956 tests that are pending. For those of you who are awaiting test results for COVID-19, please check the Ministry of Health's online portal or the link on our website. Please remember that you must remain in self-isolation while you are awaiting your results. I will now share the most current case counts. There are 80,091 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 23,774 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 138 cases and Sarnia-Lampton has reported 235 cases. Michigan now has 53,009 cases with 10,499 cases being in Detroit. Today, we are reporting 826 cases of COVID-19 in our community, an increase of 21 cases from yesterday. 13 new cases are in migrant farms and eight are in the community. 36% of our cases have occurred in long-term care homes, including both residents and staff. 465 cases have resolved and 21 people are in the hospital. 17% of our cases are between the ages of 20 and 29. 16% are between the ages of 30 and 39. 15% are between the ages of 50 and 59. And 18% of our cases are 80 years or older. 44% of our cases are male and 55% are female with 1% unknown. Our community has lost a total of 63 people to COVID-19. 47 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care and retirement homes. One, re one additional retirement home has come out of outbreak. Our health unit is currently working with 13 long-term care and retirement homes that are in COVID-19 outbreak. Testing for COVID-19 is based on a clinical assessment. Testing should be considered even if you have one symptom. Common symptoms include fever, a new or worsening cough, and shortness of breath. However, other symptoms may, may be present, such as a sore throat, difficulty swallowing, unexplained fatigue, an increase in falls, nausea, vomiting, chills, and headaches. If you are feeling unwell and need to seek a health assessment for COVID-19, there are several options. Complete the online assessment tool at ontario.ca, contact Telehealth Ontario, or call your primary care provider for a phone or virtual assessment. To access local health care uh, a local health care provider walk-in clinic or virtual medical assessment, please visit ehealthwindsoressex.ca. Windsor Essex has two COVID-19 assessment centers, Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington and Windsor Regional Hospital Olet Campus. Please note that SOHAC, the Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Centre in Windsor also offers, offers testing for First Nations, Métis, Inuit people and their families. Please note that testing is now available for people who have even one symptom of COVID-19. Please continue to visit WeChu.org for the most current information and case counts. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health for further updates regarding COVID-19. Good morning, everyone. People who use substance are a particular risk group with very specific needs and may be at an increased risk of COVID-19 due to a number of physical and or social and environmental reasons. These include compromised health as a result of their drug use or substance use, including smoking and vaping, the use of opioids and methamphetamine because of their effects on respiratory and pulmonary health. Opioids slow breathing and have already been shown to increase mortality in people with respiratory diseases. Reduced lung capacity from COVID-19 could be a problem for them. Methamphetamine has been shown to produce significant pulmonary damage and this will likely increase the risk of negative outcomes if used during a COVID-19 infection. Vaping, 
like smoking, may also harm lung health, but emerging evidence suggests that exposure to aerosol from e-cigarettes harms the cells of the lung and reduce the ability to respond to infection. There are also additional consideration for those with alcohol use disorder, such as withdrawal management and added comorbidities of hep C and HIV. Those with mental health and substance use issues are particularly vulnerable and may experience worsening of existing mental and substance use symptoms. The Windsor Sex Community Opioid and Substance Strategy, uh, VCOS, was initially developed to address the cri this uh, opioid crisis by creating a local response based on existing best practices, community feedback, and engagement with people who live uh, with, uh, with lived experience using substances. This local response prioritizes the health and well-being of all in Windsor and Essex County by promoting evidence-based practices across the four pillars of Canadian drug and substance strategy. That is prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and enforcement. Through ongoing community dialogue, the emergence of additional local data, the leadership committee of the Windsor Essex County, uh, Windsor Essex Community Opioid and Substance Strategy, led by the Windsor Essex County Health Unit and the Essex Windsor EMS, expanded its scope to include other substances to become a poly substance strategy. This morning, an alert was issued by Windsor Essex Community Opioid and Substance Strategy. The Windsor Essex County Health Unit Surveillance and Monitoring System identified an alert regarding drug-related emergency department visits between the dates of May 12th to May 18th, 2020. Fentanyl was detected in 12 of the 18 overdose cases reported by the hospitals, as well as three additional overdoses involving other type of opioids. Drug-related emergency department visit for the first quarter of 2020, January, February, and March, have been higher than the same period if we are comparing it from 2018 and 2019. Stress, anxiety, and self-isolation experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic can have a negative impact on substance use issues, including relapse and or increase in the use and risk of overdose. Individuals who use substance may be at increased risk for COVID-19 if they have existing health issues as a result of their use. If a person or a loved one use opioids and or methamphetamine, this risk may increase further due to the effect of these drugs have on breathing and other health uh, and heart health. Group-based supports and social connectedness is a key part of recovery for substance use disorders. Many regular suspense services have been disrupted during this time, and those seeking support for substance use disorder may find it difficult to navigate the current system. To prevent overdose and protect yourself or a loved one during COVID-19, practice physical distancing and do not use the drugs alone. Carry an naloxone kit. To find out how to access naloxone kit, please visit vcos.ca. Do not share pipes, needles, or other equipments for substance use. Wash hands before and after substance use. For harm reduction resources and supplies, visit the AIDS Committee of Windsor website. During this particularly challenging time, it is important that people dealing with substance use know that they are not alone and the community continues to support them. While we have shifted considerable resources to support COVID-19, the other important and urgent work of the health unit and our partners does not has, uh, has not stopped. The VICHU continues to work with our partners to support individuals who use substance. For individuals seeking help or support for substance use disorder, talk to your primary care provider about treatment options and support. Access virtual support by visiting the VCOS website or ehealthwindsorsx.ca. Visit the Mental Health and Addiction Urgent Care Center House of Software Scenes 12 Hours uh, Crisis t Telephone Line. And for any information and more information on where to get help with substance use, a list of available local resources and online supports for people who use substance or those seeking treatment is available at vcos.ca website, w-e-c-o-s-s.ca. Thank you. We'll now take questions from the media. We'll start with the Windsor Star. So, Dr. Ahmed, just to get a little bit of clarity, uh, so the alert is because of nine uh, overdose incidents over a 24-hour period? 
not 24 hour period for over a week period, which is higher than the what we expect it to be. Uh, out of those uh, 12 um, um, uh, opioid related, nine of them are a uh, result of fentanyl. Sorry, fentanyl was detected in 12 of the 18 overdoses that was reported. So the 18 are over the course of a week? That is correct, from May 12th to May 18th. Okay, um, in the alert, I'm, I'm reading it says over a 24 hour period on May 16th, there were nine substance misuse and overdose related emergency department visits flagged by the system. Is that included in the 18? That is correct, yes. Okay. So it's 18 over the week, and then over a 24-hour period on May 16th, there were nine. Yes. Okay. Is there any relation between this, uh, uh, the, the, these overdoses and, and the COVID-19 pandemic situation? Um, as I just mentioned, stress, anxiety, and self uh, self isolation uh, can be can trigger uh, substance use, and even can trigger relapse, or uh, make people use more than what they normally use. It puts them at a higher risk of overdose and fatality associated with uh, uh, with uh, with the substance use. So that's these alerts are designed uh, uh, to alert the community for uh, an impending crisis or if something is happening in the community, and ensure that they are connected connected with the services, the, the, the first responders and the other support agencies are actively looking for it and uh, are providing the support that, uh, they, that these individuals need. Is this the first time that there's been an alert of this nature uh, since the lockdown happened? Uh, yes, since uh, COVID has started, this is the first alert that we have issued. Thank you. Any questions from CBC? Yes, good morning. Um, so May 16th was the 24 hour period. Why did it take so long for an alert to be released? So we need uh, data uh, and then uh, the data collection, how it's flagged and then um, following up to ensure that uh, what drugs are we talking about. They, these alerts are uh, are generated through different sources. One is the uh, the surveillance system that is in place in the in the emergency department. And then there are also flags by the uh, Essex Windsor EMS if they are picking up anyone with an overdose. Overdoses can be different type and it can and it's not differentiated unless it's properly assessed by a physician and then um, a report is made. And then by the time that report is made, we get that report and we try to get it out as soon as possible. And uh, generally it, it takes a day or two to get all that information straight and then uh, we issue the alert. You said, or I'm not sure who, who said this morning, but there were 13 cases from migrant workers. Are there, is there an outbreak now at the greenhouse? Well, we are working with many of these uh, f farms right now, and a lot of them are contacts of the initial cases, which were already self-isolating, and uh, we are uh, working with all of them to, to get a better handle of who else uh, can be at risk and how we can isolate them to, uh, to prevent uh, the spread of, um, um, in, in other workers. Are there any things that haven't been implemented in those situations that need to be? Uh, it's just to ensure that uh, everything is happening, in, in, uh, such as screening and uh, monitoring of these individuals who are coming to work and if they're physically distancing. There are all these measures in place. We just need to make sure that that's being implemented, and that's why we are picking up some of these individuals earlier on and uh, isolating them. So I think that works need to continue and the employers in that area, they need to be vigilant and they, they need to make sure that they are doing everything that uh, they're, they're required to do from uh, the Ministry of Labor perspective, from public health perspective, and ensuring the safety and uh, well-being of their, uh, their employees as well as the workplace. In those workplaces, are there mass testing like there has been in long-term care? Uh, the testing uh, in these places are based on the risk assessment, and uh, we've been testing more people when and uh, when whenever we come across with these cases, we isolate them and we test them accordingly. And um, that's been the approach so far. Thank you. Any questions from Blackburn? Yes, just to follow up on that. So the 13 cases, are they from multiple workplaces or one workplace? Uh, at least I, I can say they're at least two workplaces, but uh, as I said, uh, most of them are already self-isolating and uh, were a contact of a uh, uh, confirmed case. Any questions from CTV? Uh, yeah, just curious, 
the numbers for the uh, overdoses, is that an anomaly or has there been a longer stretch of data that has led you to this conclusion? You know, I mean, the week before there were nine, were there, were there previous numbers that, that showed you, hey, you know what, this graph is going in the wrong direction? Yeah, so we, we monitor that trend uh, regularly uh, every week and every couple of days. So our epidemiologists look at all those admissions on the emergency department visit. And then we compare it with the last two years to see if it's consistent with this time uh, of um, uh, drug use or uh, substance use. And if it exceeds that threshold, and not just by one or two, we use the standard deviation. And then if it exceeds two to three standard deviation, then that means that this is an anomaly. If it, there's minor variation, one or two here, we don't consider that as an anomaly. And if, but if it exceeds two to three standard deviation, that's when the alert is issued. Um, also, uh, there has been an uptick on visits at the assessment center in the last couple of days since your plea. I know Doug Ford went off yesterday, so I just your thought. I'm sure you're happy that you know more people are coming out to get tested. Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, everyone who has uh, any symptoms, uh, they should get tested. And uh, what we are uh, looking to do is to expand the testing outside of these even test assessment centers and uh, to work with uh, some of our uh, primary care providers, some of the family health teams to to allow them to, to get uh, the, uh, these uh, testing done uh, at these facilities and, uh, um, and increase the number of uh, people. Some people may be reluctant to go to the assessment center for whatever reason, but they may feel more comfortable to go to their family physicians or a, a walk-in clinic or an urgent care center, which is already open and working. And if we can get them on board uh, to get these testing done, um, that way we'll have a much better picture of what is happening in the community uh, unless we, until we get to the point of having more uh, options for testing, uh, such as point-of-care testing or uh, the type of serological testing. Um, did I, did I get this right? Doug Ford suggested that there be double up in testing uh, for healthcare workers or uh, long-term care facility workers. Do you buy into that theory? Well, I guess we we really need to to balance the resources and the risk that what we are trying to prevent. And uh, if uh, if all of that can be achieved. Um, that's great, but I think we shouldn't focus our attention on uh, on some things that uh, are uh, that are more important. So, for example, the education piece and the prevention piece is the most important piece uh, in preventing the this COVID crisis right from the beginning. That has been the focus, and that has what has led to um, uh, not seeing the surge uh, in 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 hospitals or even in the communities. And, and that should be our focus. When people are thinking that uh, if, I am, if I am tested, I am safe, that's the false understanding that we want people to, to, to stay away from. And I think they, everyone, everyone is at risk. Even if I'm tested today, what I do in the next two minutes could put me at a risk and at a danger. So I think we, we need to recognize that the important piece among all of this is the prevention piece. And if someone is symptomatic, yes, absolutely. We need to detect those cases as soon as possible. And that's why I was, I was mentioning that if we get a point of care testing, that can give us a result very quickly. The current test that we have, the nasopharyngeal swab, it's a diagnostic test. It doesn't give you that level of information that you need or, or even picking up earlier on in the infection. So I think we need to be careful of what is available right now and if there's any ability to change that. And I made this uh, comment uh, a couple of days earlier as well, that a lot of the, the uh, uh, I guess, um, uh, some people think that uh, screening tests that we use, even for some of the chronic diseases, that will help. So this is not a chronic disease. We are talking about an infectious disease. Chronic disease take time to develop, and identifying those risk factors that put a person at a higher risk of developing those chronic diseases, there is an ability for us to alter that course. So if someone who's obese, if we identify through screening factors that they have a high cholesterol level or if they have like a, a pre-diabetic type of uh, uh, sugar levels, there is an ability for us to work with those people, individuals, to change and alter the course of their disease to prevent any further complications such as stroke or uh, heart disease or any other things uh, that they may experience. With infectious diseases, when we are screening, we are not preventing any of that. 
we're just testing at a point of time which could change the very next day and then or even a day earlier. So there is no ability to prevent that. So that's why it, we need to be clear that this is a diagnostic test and this is not a test to identify who is at risk or who is not at risk. And uh, uh, if we have to go there, uh, I think we, we really need to, to, uh, to look at the point of care testing and uh, make it uh, wide, uh, widely available uh, to ensure that at a given point in time, so if I'm coming at work and if I am at risk and if you test me, if it's positive, you send me home, that's better. Versus if I'm coming back tested and then I'm still working, I still have the ability to spread the infection and nothing is changing, even though if I'm tested two days or three days later. So I would rather ensure that people are using all the right PPE, personal protective equipment. They are following all the right infection prevention and control measure every time, every time that they're interacting with any of these groups. If we can somehow make that as a second nature of every, every, every uh, healthcare workers or people working in these high risk settings, that would prevent cases. And uh, there are a lot of other system issue, right? When we're talking about these long-term care homes, what we, are, what we are trying to work with, and we have been working with all of them, even for influenza, which is, you know, we experience every year. So we, we have a good relationship with all these homes. The home's ability at times are limited by the number of people and the layout of the, of the facility whether they have the ability to isolate people in a private room or in a, in a room with other people. Can we do that? And how strictly are we following that? There are specific guidelines when we are talking about how do you are providing care. If you are providing care to COVID positive people or any type of infectious disease people, you work only with them. You do not go and work with the positive patient and then you go and work with the negative patient. So there has to be this type of staff segregation that needs to happen. Same idea, even with people, if they cannot be in one room, can they be with other people with positive cases? Yes, because they're all infected. And then ensuring that they are not being mixed with anyone else. The moment anyone develops symptoms, and if you immediately isolate them, that's where you are, you're, 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 you're putting that prevention effort again, because it takes time for them to infect others. If all of these are followed by monitoring their symptoms daily, checking their temperature, you have the ability to pick those people up and then isolate them immediately and test them and wait for the test results to come back. So I think that's, that's, where, that's where the focus should be, and I, I don't want to undermine or underestimate the importance of nasopharyngeal swab, but I also want us to be realistic and know exactly what answers are we getting when we are testing these people. We don't want to overinflate the, the importance of this. As I said, we need a variety of testing. We need more people test to get tested in the community, and uh, we will be working with, uh, with many of our healthcare providers to get this widespread testing available and get it done for anyone and everyone who is experiencing any symptoms to have a better understanding of what's happening. And anyone uh, in these high-risk setting, I think we really need to have a good conversation and uh, talk about how are we practicing all these measures, such as infection prevention control measures and PPE use? Uh, we, we need to look at that. Any questions from AMA 100? Yes, Dr. Ahmed, when was the last time an alert was issued for the drug overdose misuse? Um, I don't have that number, as, but I think. Ballpark? Maybe in February or uh, around that timeline, I, if I recall. So earlier this year? Yeah. Okay. All right. When you heard yesterday that the board fireworks were going to go ahead at the end of August, what went through your mind? <laughs> Uh, I was uh, concerned immediately, and I said, okay, what's going on here? Um, and uh, I am still uh, concerned that uh, we don't know what would happen, what situation looks like in August, but any type of congregation at this stage, as we know, even under the Civil uh, Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, is not allowed for people more than five or any type of organized event even happening in the city or in the region. So we need to be very clear that what is allowed and what's not allowed. What 
could happen in the future. I don't know if the province come back and maybe lose those restrictions. If the case counts in our community go down to zero or uh, there's no spread, or if it can go in the opposite direction where we have hundreds of cases every day. So I think uh, we, it, it just makes me nervous that uh, when people are thinking about it and uh, events like these can, can really trigger the, what we are calling as like a second wave uh, even locally. We know even in 1918, 1919, uh, Spanish flu, the second wave was much more deadlier and infected much many, many more people. And the whole reason was people came out and they celebrated and then they felt that you know everything is gone and then now they can meet and that really triggered a big big wave with uh, more cases and more death so I'm, I'm really concerned about that part that if it happens i think uh, there are options for people to uh, watch it from their comfort of their home uh, watch it on tv or by any means this is a different time this is an unprecedented unprecedented time and i think we need to be careful in how we are behaving and acting in the community, and uh, it's all of us, it's everyone's responsibility to, to be part of that and reduce the spread. Over the last several days, we've had you know, eight cases, 11 cases. I think the last time we had 21 cases was about a week and a half ago. So um, 21 cases today, uh, do you put a lot of weight into that or wait and see? When I look at the number, obviously, I was really concerned, and I was just uh, looking at what uh, is leading to that number, and my initial thought was to go back and see, uh, get more details on these cases, and uh, what we, what we, what I, I was concerned about last weekend was actually pretty nice, and we know the incubation period can be as short as five days, three to five days, and maybe it could be a result of that. So we are uh, looking at investigating all of those, uh, those cases. Uh, and we, we try our best to report these numbers to the community, so at least community is aware. But our case and contact management follow-up uh, could, could take a little bit of time. Like within 24 hours, we get in touch with all the cases and get all the information. Uh, but some of these results that we received was late night, and uh, our staff will be working to find those information. And, but that's, that's my concern and in the community. If we continue to see this pattern, maybe we need to have a conversation again to see if it's going in the right direction or should we be talking about maybe uh, putting more uh, control measures in place to avoid these type of surge, local like a mini surge if you want to call it, uh, in, the, in the community. So we will be looking at this very closely. What we noticed is 13 of these cases is, uh, was in migrant farm workers and uh, uh, so that's uh, in some way we, knew we know that's a very uh, restricted population and uh, if the similar situation happens in the community Community, I would be really concerned. Okay, thank you. Uh, we checked and the last alert was issued on December 2nd. Uh, yeah, so uh, last alert was issued on December 2nd, so I apologize for that. I thought maybe it was in February, but uh, it was in Dece December the 2nd. But we do issue a uh, different type of information bulletin to our partners, which, uh, and, and those situations are uh, happen when we don't necessarily have uh, uh, a higher number of cases uh, that surpasses like two or three standard deviation, but enough to uh, alert our partners who are working with these clients to give them the information uh, and then just being uh, watchful and careful for uh, when they're serving these clients. Okay, thank you, and thank you for looking that up. Any questions from Windsor? Oh, uh, yeah, so the uh, trend across the province with uh, pending tests has shown a large amount of those tests are from Windsor Essex. Yesterday, for example, we had 1,004 pending tests out of the 4,444 reported across the province. So that's about 22.5% just in Windsor-Essex. Is there any reason why our region has almost a quarter of all of the province's pending tests? So I think we, we uh, I personally don't know how much a delay it is in the provincial reporting of the, uh, the pending test uh, versus ours. We do our calculation based on the number of reports that we receive every day from these assessment centers and other healthcare providers who are testing these people. And then what we, what we do is we subtract that number from the number of cases, uh, number of results that we receive every day. So it's, it's a rough calculation from our end to uh, based on the, the data that we receive. Uh, there is no uh, perfect system at this point to give you an accurate indicator of how many of these test results are pending. The other part is that 
most of these labs are, uh, at least in the GTA area or other places, they are using a, a system which is electronic and that makes the test results readily available for us. Uh, it's still it's it's a paper that we are receiving, and uh, there we are we are receiving some of the results electronically, but we are also receiving paper-based results. And sometimes these paper-based results can uh, can get delayed, or the fax machine is not accepting them, and then we have to contact the lab again to get the results. So there are some of these kinks in the system, uh, but we do our best uh, estimate uh, based on these uh, numbers that of testing that we receive versus the number of results that we've already received. So I can't really say that it's uh, it's the 100% accurate system, but is it, it, it is the best system that we are using right now to, to get a better sense of what is happening locally. Any further questions from the Windsor Star? Uh, yeah, Dr. Um, just about the fireworks. I understand that uh, the city of Detroit, they're going to be shutting down Hart Plaza and parts of the Detroit Riverfront uh, in order to keep people from congregating to, to watch it. Is, is there any possibility of that happening in Windsor? Will the health unit be in any kind of consultations with the city of Windsor about shutting down the waterfront? So we've been approached by the city of Windsor uh, late last night uh, on this topic, and uh, we will be connecting with them to have a, a, a strategy in place, uh, weighing all the options and consider all the options that are available for us. Thank you. Any further questions from CBC? Yes, uh, the one long-term care home, I think it's Annika, they're now off the outbreak list. They had 24 um, residents that had uh, confirmed cases and I think it was 15 staff. That's a lot of, that's, that's good news, right? Does that speak to what Huron uh, or Heron Terrace may be coming close to, to getting off outbreak when you have a large amount of people finally getting off that outbreak list? Well, uh, all these, uh, as the, I think I mentioned, are criteria for rescinding the outbreak. It uh, it means that uh, there are no new cases. So um, uh, any of these facilities that are meeting that criteria, they come out of the outbreak. Uh, facilities that do not meet those criteria, they continue to stay in outbreak, and we continue to work with them. Uh, and uh, I think that effort will continue until all of these homes are uh, out of the outbreak.